Okay, we're going to be starting in Lesson 6 uh, this morning. So if you want to go ahead and turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, talking about bearing with one another in love here. But before we get started in that, um, you know, it, it talks about the, in the book here the divine imperative. Have we really talked much about uh, imperatives and indicatives? H have we said anything about imperatives, what an imperative even is? Because each one of these chapters talks about the divine imperative in it, uh, kind of the beginning of each chapter. And I don't know if we've even really talked about what an imperative is. Uh, can anybody, what is an imperative? Each one of the chapters talks about it. What is it? Go ahead, Ash. A command, okay. Anyone else? What's proper, lawful, what is right? Do it that way. What was that last part, Jim? I didn't. What is right. What is right, okay. I think it even goes beyond. It's a non negotiable, so it is something that is right, but it's something that we are to do or to be. It's a non-negotiable here, what we're talking about here. Now, when we look at Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, it's more doctrinal in nature. And, and with the doctrinal aspect there, it talks about indicatives. So it, in chapters 1 through 3, the doctrinal, it, 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 it talks about, it uses sentences that are a statement of fact, you know, about what God has done for us. And then in verses or chapters four through six, it's the application, which is more the imperatives. These are non-negotiables that you are to do or to be in chapters four through six there. Now, it's interesting. I thought in chapters one through three, where there's so many indicatives, what God has done for us, the facts here, there's only one imperative in chapters one through three. But in chapters 4 through 6, the application, there are 40 imperatives. This is what you are to be like. This is what you are to do. Okay, now, think about this question here. Why do we emphasize and pound home imperatives of things that we do within these four walls, such as the Lord's Supper, non-instrumental music, those types of things, but we don't always put as much emphasis on imperatives of the heart that we're going to be talking about here. Why do we oftentimes pound home on things that occur in the four walls here rather than what we must do or be like regarding our heart? What we'll be talking about this morning. Discomforting for people, I think. Okay, discomforting? Yeah, like like uh, you have to actually look at yourself. <laughs> exactly. You, you have to look at yourself, and and as, as Gary Henry often says, this is where the rubber meets the road, you know, when we talk about our hearts like this. Um, you know, it, it, and, and the scribes and Pharisees had the same problem in, in Matthew 23 where it talks about you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So what occurs in these four walls, the, the imperatives there are important, but we can't put aside those things, the imperatives of the heart that we're, we're going to be talking about this morning here. Um, now, I think as we look at um, chapter four here, I want to go back just a little bit and talk about um, the prior relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles and, and think about the dynamics of their relationship and think about how what we're going to be talking about in chapters four here, um, think about how this would affect their views of one another, and yet they are still to 
uh, have these imperatives that are talked about here. But that wall uh, that Paul talks about in, in chapters 2 and 3 there, the enmity, the hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. But think about, think about this here, how the Gentiles what they thought, or what the Jews thought about the Gentiles, they were assumed to be morally deficient and pure, decadent and sinful. They believed the Gentiles were heathens and pagans. The Israelites had a strong nationalistic pride, continually in battles with the Gentiles. Rome had been very oppressive to the Israelites. And then think of what the Greeks and Romans looked down on the Jewish customs. They thought that the Sabbath was a sign of laziness and often criticized Jews as lazy. They thought that circumcision was barbaric. They thought Jewish dietary laws were ridiculous and antisocial, and they accused Jews of separatism and unsociability. So think about what Paul, you know, what Christ has done to tear down this wall, to tear down this type of thinking between these two. And because they are new in Christ, uh, how they are to view one another. And when we look at this, the, the enmity that was between uh, the Jews and the Gentiles, I was just thinking about, you know, the dynamics of this relationship and how they butted heads like this. And I was thinking about the relationship between Christians when we have differing viewpoints uh, from one another and how we sometimes butt heads, but how we are to be in Christ with the things that we're going to talk about today. Because of that special relationship we have with Christ and, and, and how we are to be and how it's to affect our hearts. Uh, if, you know, w with the Jews and the Gentiles, with, with that enmity between them, and if they can love and, and be patient and endure in love with one another, how we can, we can, also, uh, we can also do this. Um, now, Let's go ahead and turn over to chapter 4 in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And if somebody would read verses 1 through 3 here. 1 through 3. Ethan. Yeah. Thank you. That was, we think about the scripture here, verses one through three here. I, I just want to remind us of the aspirations and goals that we had talked about uh, as a family in Christ here at 25th Street and how we all came up with these, these aspirations and goals in our family meetings here but how we are to be forgiving to one another. Now keep in mind, as we talk about these aspirations and goals, keep in mind these things that, we, that Ethan read in, in verses one through three here. But how we are to be, we want to be forgiving of one another. The unity among the body as the scriptures teach that we're gonna be looking at today. Humility demonstrated, we're all growing and we are all imperfect and how that's so important to realize. And we're going to talk about that, how we all have faults. We're all imperfect. Deal with conflicts, the scriptures teach. A positive attitude. Encourage through reminding one another. More fellowship, more time together. All serious about spreading the good news. Get out of our comfort zones. Grow so that we're not satisfied. And I think we talked about this uh, within the past week or so about getting out of our comfort zone and evangelizing, just telling others about what Christ has done for us. Lay aside our fears of being persecuted and judged by others, awareness of what visitors see and feel, and lots of children learning about Christ in our classrooms. So with all of these uh, uh, aspirations and goals that we've talked about and how what we're talking about today can help us to... Uh, to fulfill those aspirations and goals here. But with what Ethan talked about, what, what Ethan read for us, the attitudes of a worthy walk with Christ, this humility 
that we're to have, the meekness, the long-suffering, the forbearing in love, and if somebody would, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, somebody read 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 1, verses 11 through 12. Okay, thank you. So we see here, you know, in Ephesians, it talks about that worthy of the calling. And we see in 2 Thessalonians here also that may count you worthy of his calling. And by his power, so he enables us. God enables us. And that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose. So every resolve that we have to do good. He may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. So every work of faith, by faith, God's power in us, we are able to carry out our resolves to do good. So it's his power. And, and you know, in Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about that same power that raised Christ from the dead can be, you know, in us and how we can carry out you know, these imperatives that he's talking about. We can carry out being humble because of his empowering us to do that. We can carry out being meek. We can carry out being long-suffering. We can carry out being forbearing in love. So just some of these things here, it, it's just important to, to realize that God can help us to do these things, even though it seems very difficult at times uh, when, when, when we're having problems in our relationships with one another within the church, but how God can help us to, to be the kind of people we need to be. So as, as we look down through here, what was spoken of, you know, this lowliness in mind, this humble opinion of oneself, lowliness of mind, when you know you have it, you lost it. I, I, I kind of like that quote there. Um, gentle and meek, that power under control. Uh, how, you know, in, in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, how when we think of meek, it's that power under control rather than uh, kind of milk toast attitude that we think people have when they're meek, but it's actually the opposite. It's power under control. Patience, long-suffering. When you see that long-suffering there, it's, it's long-tempered and then bearing or forbearing with one another in love. So... Uh, that, that first question there. Uh, you know, and, and, and then that lowliness and humility there. Humble of opinion oneself. I had pride promotes disunity. Think about pride in our relationship with God. What does pride do with our relationship with God? There's disunity. Think about what pride does with our relationship with our spouse. Creates disunity. Think about what pride does with our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It, it promotes disunity. So uh, that, that idea of humility is so extremely important. But, but think about the first question there. What does bearing, forbearance, make allowances for mean? Kind of our, our main text for today. Bear with one another in love. Say that again. Can you read that question again? Yeah. What does bearing with forbearance make allowances for mean in Ephesians 2 here? Now you've had an extra hour of rest today, so you can't be tired. So what does that mean to forbear with one another? Margaret. Well, I'm going to do this, but 
Okay, good. Yeah, Samantha. Uh, um, I also add, like, being patient, because uh, some people, like, something I always think about, and particularly when I'm dealing with a difficult person, is to remember that I myself am very difficult to deal with sometimes, and so just, like, I think forbearance can also be um, being patient with people who may kind of test your patience a little bit. Right, right. Forbearing that idea of enduring uh, with one another in love, because... When I think of that idea, Joy, when I think of that idea of enduring, enduring is not always something that's easy to do, but it is still, um, well, I don't know how I want to, how I want to phrase that. Greg? This love that we're talking about here, that Greg's talking about here, it's not the phileo, it's not the eros, it's not the storge, it's agape. An act of the will that leads to a positive action on behalf of its object. Exactly what Greg's talking about, yielding to them because you want what's best for them rather than what my thoughts are on this matter. Okay, Joy? One of the reasons I said I was going to make this uh, <clears throat> the key is for me uh, to remind myself of uh, the motive. What's my motive? What's my intent? Is it to be right or for their benefit? Of course, not conceding on truth, but right. when it's Yeah, yeah. Daring with one another in agape. Okay? And I think as we think about these things, if we can cultivate that idea of curiosity and compassion, especially that, I, uh, that idea of curiosity, find out why they think, why they're thinking the way they're thinking. What life experiences have they had that makes this so important to them. But, but I, I really think curiosity and trying to find out, and, and like we've talked about, asking questions and going three deep in the questions with them, but, but just kind of uh, 
drilling down to find out why, uh, why they hold these beliefs. Joy? Yes. I'm aware of what's been done for me. I'm way more likely to be forbearing and patient and yeah. humble. And not, yes, exactly. And a lot of times we may think, well, if this person's been forbearing with me, then I'll be forbearing with them. And that's not what this is talking about here. You know, they, they could be the exact opposite of being forbearing with you, and we still need to be have this type of an attitude with them. Now, something in relationships that we can find ourselves in is something called negative sentiment override. And it, it, it's a negative perspective on a relationship that leads to misunderstanding and escalating conflicts. And what this, what, what this really boils down to is, is every action is perceived uh, through a negative lens. A, a lens that confirms our opinion of that person. So this negative sentiment override. And I think what Paul is talking about here is something called positive sentiment override. A positive perspective on the relationships that helps partners maintain a positive view of each other in the situation, even during conflict. Um, this idea of all that Christ has done for us. This idea of how we have a special relationship because of what Christ has done for you and what Christ has done for me. We have a special relationship. So we need as Christians to have this positive sentiment override as we endure in love with one another, as we're completely humble, as we're gentle, as we're long-suffering, we need to look at everything through this lens of what Christ has done for us and the special relationship that we have with one another. Okay. Now, what if Josh was looking at things through negative sentiment override and you were leaving your shoes everywhere? That just confirms to him, you know, his, what he's thinking. But out of love, how we have this positive sentiment override with each other, you know. So, okay. That question 1A there, we are not to bear with our brethren as they continue in sin. What areas should we, in what areas should we bear with one another? Exactly. We were, we were going to talk about that, and we'll just bring that up right now. Be, because I, I, I agree. I, I kind of disagree with, I think there's two sides to this question here. Well, I think, like, continuing in sin, in my opinion, is just, you're being rebellious. Whereas right. If, if you're struggling in sin, it's like, you might do it, maybe even a lot, but you either don't want to, or there's some other emotion that might be causing you to have a hard time. 
Right. I think that idea of condoning somebody who is rebellious and walking in sin is different than walking beside somebody who is having difficulty with sin. I think in those instances, we do endure with them in love. Because I think, like, if you, if, if you treat someone who's struggling in sin like someone who is being rebellious, that's not going to help. It'll probably make the issue worse. Right. Anyone else? Okay. You know, we talk about you know, walking beside someone in sin. Um, it is in our nature to see someone's behavior and say, well, that is who this person is to the world. That is one of their core characteristics. And I think we often assume that core characteristics are unchangeable. feels a, a shame to it or a, uh, a desire to, to see the negativity in their own life to understand that, yeah, I keep going back to the same well, but it's bad for me. You know, it, it's a habit. Uh, I need to do a better job of understanding that just because it looks like a core characteristic doesn't mean that that person's not struggling with it and wants to do better yeah. and wants to be rid of that, that thing, which is enslaved them. that's where you show tremendous forbearance and patience. When someone has an attitude of uh, willful Right. I'm going to put some barriers up because your actions are what are harming me. Um, if that, again, that person is not, if they have an attitude that I, I'd like to get over this, but I just don't know how right now, I don't feel strong enough, I'm too weak, I'm still going to go back to that well. Um, then how, how long do I put up with that, that pain and that hurt? And, and, and when we're talking about walking beside or bearing with those who continue in sin, we have to ask ourselves, is my bearing with them enabling them? You know, because we can enable somebody to, to continue in this, this, this behavior. But like, like we said, if somebody is truly trying to, uh, uh, you know, overcome this sin in their life. And again, I go back to that idea of compassion and curiosity. A lot of times when people are doing drugs or when they're 
they're um, drinking or when they're in behavior that they should not be in and they're sinning, often, often, often they're trying to cover up some kind of pain in their life. Okay, they, they may be doing alcohol or they may be doing drugs because they don't know how to deal with this pain. You know, they, they could have been molested. There is just so many different things that they're trying to deal with this pain in their life. And often we, we point our fingers and say, look at them. They're just, they're just terrible people because of what they're doing. And we don't know why they're doing it. Okay, they, they, and, and I have come to the conclusion that most often it has to do with pain that they're trying to cover up. And they use sinful things to try to cover up that pain. Grace, you had a... I was just reading from that it matters to me because I was just going to modify the point you were making and say maybe it's the manner in which we're bearing with them. Because I, I think it's important that, I mean, God, God obviously is long-suffering toward us. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I existed to the point of being able to repent and God still allowed me to exist in spite of thoughts, Troy? Good thoughts. Anybody else? Yeah. Jim. Yeah, this is a great point. I try to help other people. It's always really good to help anybody and everybody you can, but you've got to be cautious and careful. Just like a man drowning in the water, be careful he'll drown you, take you down with him. And the same way with people, just make sure you don't let them take you down with them and help them all you can. Yeah. Okay. Question 1B there. Why is love necessary to fulfill this responsibility? Because if you don't, like, let me think about how I'm going to word that. It's a good question. Because if you 
don't do it in love, you'll just constantly. You're not going to be help. You're not going to be helping somebody if you don't do something in love. You're like, oh. okay. Like, they're a lot. They're going to be a lot less likely to. Like, if you're trying to correct them, they're not going to be very likely to listen to you if you're not doing it in love. Okay, Liz. Right, right. And, and, and again, we're talking about that idea of agape love, looking out for their best interest, which is a matter of our will, not a matter of our feelings. You know, um, I, I had down here unconditional and charitable, given regardless of, not, of whether or not it's returned to us. And that reminded me when we talked about this, this agape love here of, of Christ's imperative in John chapter 13. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So it, it, it's this new command. It's not in time, but it's in quality. Uh, you know, as I have loved you, totally selflessness and how we are to be selfless and look at the best interest for that person even when, let, let me just put it that way, even when. Anyone else? The same appears in Colossians 3, 12 and 14 through here. So Look at the similarities between these attitudes that we're to take on in Colossians as in Ephesians here. Put on therefore, so this clothing that we are to put on as elect of God, holy beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgive you, so also do ye. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So it, it talks about what corresponding attitudes surround this phrase and how do they contribute to bearing with one another in love. So, so basically the same attitudes that we see in Ephesians, we see here. Um, and then that, that question 2A down there, List the opposite of each of these attitudes. You know, in bowels of mercy, I had unsympathetic, judgmental, heartless. Instead of kindness, I see harshness towards another. Humbleness of mind, I see pride. Meekness, I see self-serving or self-will. Long-suffering, I see impatient. Forbearing with one another in love, again, I see impatience, intolerance, mercilessness, merciless. So these attitudes that we can't have. Again, with these imperatives, these are things that we have to be or we are to, uh, to do. They're, they're, they're non-negotiable here. So we must have, we must work at having these bowels of mercy, <coughs> kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering, and bearing with one another in love. So I, I had down here, what practical steps can you take to endure for bear with one who you disagree with, who frustrates you, who may have even hurt you? Um, so, so what practical steps? Samantha. Number one, praying for yourself and praying that you'll get that patience and that you'll be you know, less frustrated, that kind of thing. But also praying for them. I mean, I think that can give you, even just praying for the person, can give you a lot more patience with them if you focus on praying for them and praying that 
you know, if, if that they change, if they need to change, that kind of thing, and, that, and asking God how you're going to help them with that, uh, things like that. I'm just putting a lot of prayer and help for the situation yep. like this. Yep. And, and remember what we read in Second Thessalonians and, and in Ephesians 1.19, how he enables us, how he helps us. Um, so, so again, back to the prayer, you know, and, and just realize it with that firm faith that he will help me. Uh, let me go back there. I think it's a big question to ask when you're dealing with someone who is difficult. Is you know, in your prayers, you can ask, you can ask God, like, what can I do to help that person? Because sometimes when you, I've had situations where I, I prayed that kind of prayer, and I'm like, if something, an opportunity came up that I wasn't expecting, a way of helping them came up that I wasn't that I hadn't even thought of before. Yep. And that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. So he will help us. What else, Joy? Question number three there on the next page. The church is not made up of the most socially connected. Who made up the church of Corinth? And it talks about 1 Corinthians 1.26 there, but instead of going there, I want to go to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. And then over in Titus, we won't go there, but in Titus 3, 1 through 8, it talks about how we were. So what I got from this question here is remember who you were and where you came from. Remember who you were and where you came from, what Christ has done for you. Some were liars, some were, you know, we could go, go down through the, the, the sins that people within the church have committed. So. Okay, so we'll pick up on uh, question number four there. On Wednesday. Thank you for all your comments. <laughs>